Thank you, Elsa. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to give this talk. Uh, it's unfortunate that I can't be in Vigo to give this talk, but nonetheless, uh, I'll do my best to excite you from the distance. So what I want to talk about today is um, uh, some research we've been doing on the continental slope of Atlantic Canada, and my talk is entitled Into the Deep Epibenthic Communities on the Continental Slope of Atlantic Canada. So before I start, here on my title slide, you can see what the North Atlantic looks like on our side of the pond. Um, much calmer than your side of the pond, I guess. But uh, this is August, and it's uh, clearly a rare occurrence. So what I will focus on today, uh, the region of, of, of focus, is the Gulf of Maine, which you see here on the left-hand side, circle in red, uh, on the northeast coast of North America. Sorry, on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you see a blow-up of, of, the, of the Gulf of Maine with... Um, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick on that right-hand side of that line that you see crossing the Gulf. That is the border between um, Canada and the U.S. And um, that border I will bring up again near the end of my talk because it, can, it has caused a significant impediment in collaborative research um, across the two nations. Um, so, first of all, I will start with some research that resulted from um, expert groups of the Gulf of Maine project for the sense of marine life. So the sense of marine life have different, had different projects. One of them focused on the Gulf of Maine, specifically because the Gulf has had a long history of research exploitation by humans and because it's in such proximity to inhabited areas and because it can focus as it can use as a focal ecosystem uh, in its entirety. So what you see in this slide is uh, depth distributions in the Gulf. In red, in warmer colors, you have deeper depths. And so those are the depths that both this uh, expert group um, focused on and the depths that I'll be focusing today in my research. So, this is the summary of spatial distribution of known species along those regions in red that I showed you earlier. And these are species that occur only from 150 meters depth all the way to the sea floor. It includes demersal and benthic, both macro and megafauna. These are only known occurrences. Um, and you can see from this slide that warmer colors again include, indicate larger number of species and you can see that these warmer colors, the reds and, and the yellows, occur in particular canyons labeled there, oceanographer, hydrographer, Corsair, etc., as well as just a little bit north of Corsair at Northeast Channel. So there's definitely, from the literature, there are regions of, of hot spots uh, of biodiversity. Now this is a, a figure that shows the number of species. This is from the same study. On the inset there, you see the red, red outline of the, of the study region. Again, only deep uh, areas. And um, what you see is the number of database records that existed for this region uh, versus the number of species uh, from those database records. And you can see that there is a positive relationship. The more records we have, the more species we get. And this has been a finding both for our uh, the sense of marine life, and for all of those that do deep sea research, um, we don't really know the species that are out there, and the more we visit these places, uh, the more species we find. So the continental slope, it's at the very top, that has the largest number of database records, whereas the continental rise, you can see at the bottom left, um, it has obviously fewer records in the region. <clears throat> Now, based on these results, uh, you can see the cumulative number of species over time, and each one of these lines corresponds to different areas, canyons, continental rise, continental slope, a region called Northeast Channel, uh, seamount, bow seamount, and the shelf edge. And so you can see that for the continental slope, the cumulative number of species is increasing with time, this is the, the line, the dotted line up at the top. The green line, the seamount line, is sort of flat up to about the mid-90s, and then it has a rapid ascent. 
Again, what this figure indicates is that the more effort we put into this research, the more species we find, and nowhere have we reached asymptotes. And in the regions where you have reached asymptotes, that is not because we keep going out there and we're, in, and we're not finding any new species, it's because we haven't been out there in, in some time. Here's the last graph from the study I would like to show you. And here what you see is, is plotted is the similarity in species richness between regions of that deep sea section of the Gulf of Maine and the shelf, the continental shelf of the Gulf of Maine. And if you see the far left bar there, that's the highest bar that has all the species richness, from, includes all the deep sea habitats. And you can see that there's about 28% of the species, when you pull the whole deep sea uh, of the Gulf of Maine, sample deep sea of the Gulf of Maine, they share about 25 to 28% of the species with a continental shelf. And then you can see that there are different regions, um, sub subsections of, of this deep sea region, the canyons, continental rise, that have a, a lower proportion of their species richness shared with the shelf. Again, a lot of this has to do with um, little sampling effort. So what we have been doing with our research and our objectives have been to sort of augment this knowledge as much as we can. And so one objective is to describe the distribution, abundance, and diversity of the deep sea epifauna in different habitats and at different spatial scales. And so by epifauna, I mean organisms that live on the ocean floor, not in the sediment. And the second task has been to relate these patterns to habitat structure. So what we do is we try to generate these patterns both in, in, in different spatial scales ranging from, me, ranging from meters all the way to the entire Gulf of Maine as much as we extend our data and to also assess variability at each one of those scales. In order to do this, and when I say we, and I'll keep saying we through the talk, uh, I include a large list of collaborators and students that I will get to in the end of the acknowledgement slide, so this is not me alone. Um, as part of our effort in um, 2005, we, we established this, what is called the Gulf of Maine Discover Corridor Initiative, and we're still working on this. This was um, a collaborative effort with government agencies, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and various universities in the region. And so what this corridor initiative is, is we set aside, essentially, we defined an ocean space where we can focus our research, integrate our research, assemble knowledge, and conduct outreach. So rather than going a whole bunch of different places at different times, we all focus in the same region. And I'll show you that this region covers a range of habitats and so we can always relate ha uh, patterns uh, between habitats because we're focused on the same part of the ocean. And so this cone that you see there on that figure uh, shows that discovery corridor as it's been outlined. I should point out that this is not a closed corridor to activities. This is just a space that we've defined where we can focus our research. And you can see it covers a wide range of habitats all the way from the intertidal out to the abyssal plains to 6,000 meters that we haven't really visited yet, but we plan on doing it. So in this figure, you see on the left-hand side, uh, the corridor again outlined in, in those blue lines, and each one of those dots that you see corresponds to a different sampling station that we have sampled over the years since 2005. And so you see some regions there that I will get, physio regions that I will get to in a minute, but again, we have used, we have gone on, on 2005, in 2005, in 2006, in 2009, in 2010, we have done research cruises there on the vessel, government vessel Hudson that you see there on, on the right hand side. And so because we study epifauna, most of our, our, our data are from imagery, and we have used two types of equipment. The first one is a drop camera called CAMPOD, which you see here. It has um, a, a, a camera, uh, it's a simple frame with a camera, lights, and essentially uh, laser pointers that we can actually use for scaling. And we drop this at regular intervals on the ocean floor and take images along video transects. Now there's a depth limitation to the CAMPOD, which is about 500 to 600 meters. 
Our more sophisticated equipment is uh, this remotely operated vehicle, Ropus. It's a Canadian vehicle uh, that university researchers have access to. It's an extremely competent vehicle. We would like to think that it's um, the best in the world, or certainly on top, one of the best in the world. Um, the thing about Ropos is that we have managed to outfit it with all sorts of um, equipment that is useful to our particular needs. So what you see on the top here are nets. These are plankton nets that we have put on the top so that we can actually conduct plankton toes at depth. Um, what you see on the front here is, is a, a basket, uh, a box that we use to recover uh, larva collectors, which I'll get to later in my talk. Here we have a box that carries all sorts of cores, um, eight cores in total. And of course here we have a very highly sophisticated um, operations room from where all the operations are conducted and it can accommodate quite a few people. So um, I want to show you a little bit of what the structure in this, in this uh, region, different, uh, the seafloor structure and the water column structure is like to convince you that by sampling at all these different stations that I showed you, we're capturing different kinds of habitats. And so on the left-hand side, you see a, a, a graph that indicates bathymetry. Uh, and so each one of the little dots that you see on that figure, these black dots, indicates a sampling position. And you can see that the depths of where we sample vary anywhere from 200 meters all the way down here to the um, continental slope at 3,500 meters. The map on the right-hand side shows uh, bottom topography uh, uh, data collected with OLEX. And here again, you can see warmer colors are shallow. Uh, there's structures that come shallower. And you can see that where the dots are, they, they cover different colors and therefore different topographic reliefs um, across that sampling region. These are only samples that we'll only be talking today about samples we collected in 2006 because that's how far the data have been processed. Uh, in terms of water column structure, on the left hand side you see a map of the circulation, the main ocean circulation along the Gulf of Maine. So you see that um, the main input of water is through this Nova Scotia current that enters the Gulf of Maine. Um, forms a gyre within the Gulf of Maine. Most of it lives out through this region here, Northeast Channel, which is an area where we have focused some of our research and I'll talk about, and some of this lives through the Great South Channel. But most of the water comes from Nova Scotia current and exits through Northeast Channel. So because of this constriction here, what happens is we end up with a great range in velocities of seawater. You see here just an example of surface velocities. Warmer colors are faster currents. So you can see that where the water exits, we have faster currents, and where it enters, we have relatively fast currents. But again, um, in our sampling region, we cover uh, a number of habitats with different uh, strengths of, of currents. Accordingly, there is gradients in surface temperature because you have this, this circulation patterns, um, warmer colors, Warmer water, again, you can see our stations cover a range of, of temperatures. Now, what we have done is we have sort of focused our research in a few what we call physio regions. And here you see the physio regions that I'm going to be talking about uh, today from the 2006 uh, station. So we see Jordan Basin and George's Basin. Those are deep bas two deep basins in the, um, in the Gulf. And then Northeast Channel is this region where the water exits the Gulf from. And then you see three numbers, 1,500, 2,000, and 2,500. And those are different depths where we've also sampled some transects there. So what I'll show you first is in addition to collecting data on epifauna, we also use the video of the Ropos and of Campod to collect data on substrate composition. And so what you see in this figure is substrate composition for each one of the sites going from left to right, Jordan Basin, Georgia's Basin, Northeast Channel, and the three depths. And again, warmer colors here indicate, so reds and yellows indicate finer substrates, and darker colors are cobble, boulder, and bedrock. 
So if we focus on the three continental slope decks, you can see that most of that substrate is fine sand or silty sand or sand. When we get into the Northeast Channel, which is actually an area of coral conservation, and I'll get to that a little bit later in the talk, but this is a closed area. All of the stations we have sampled within Northeast Channel are in regions that have been closed to fishing uh, activity. And so here uh, you can see a mixture of substrates, both boulders, some bedrock, but also some sand. George's Basin, uh, you can see, has a little bit of peculiar uh, structure. It has quite a bit of pebble. And then when we go into Jordan Basin, this is the region that has most of the hard substrate um, and the largest composition of bedrock. So what I want to do next is sort of follow the same figure, the same structure figure, to show you the abundance of different epifauna. And again, please bear in mind that these are very preliminary results. What I should point out here is that each of these bars corresponds to a dive. So what you see is average composition of substrate for a particular dive. So for example, we have six dives in Northeast Channel, three dives in Jordan Basin, George's Basin, and two dives in Jordan Basin. And the same will hold for the epifauna. So here's the data for the epifauna. Uh, here I plot abundance uh, of, ep, you know, of organisms uh, per meter square in each one of the sites. And so if we start with the anthozoans, we can see the anthozoans include sea pens, deep water corals, and, and anemones. And what we see is that the highest abundance is in Jordan Basin. And, and so is the lowest um, variability. And the reason for that is in Jordan Basin, we have been sampling this um, extensive bedrock, what we call the rock garden, which is essentially almost homogeneously covered with anemones and it has some coral. Um, the other point here is in Northeast Channel, anthozoans basically correspond to deep water coral. And so you can see that although abundance is lower than anemones, of course, um, there is consistent abundance across different dives, and that is because there's a, de uh, a generally homogeneous distribution of corals at those depths. Um, and not much else is happening. In Jordan ba George's Basin, we have, uh, again, anemones, but not consistently abundant in all the dives. If we turn to sponges, what we see are, again, that sponges are most consistently abundant at Northeast Channel. Their suspension feeder and Northeast Channel supports corals, but it also su supports other suspension feeders. And they're also most abundant in that same region of Jordan Basin in the rock garden. Echinoderms are much more patchy. Um, you see some peaks in abundance in George's Basin and Northeast Channel. And those correspond to dense beds of brittle stars that we have that are typically associated although not always, um, with deep water coral. So we have these regions, very sort of restricted regions that have very dense uh, beds of, of brittle stars. The other interesting thing with echinoderms is, is, unlike previous data, we're seeing an increase in abundance with depth along the continental slope. But again, we need to process a lot more samples. This is one dive at each one of those depths. The last group I'll talk about is brachiopods, and brachiopods are very abundant, but only in two regions, in the basins inside the Gulf of Maine. We don't see them in Northeast Channel, and we do not see them on the continental slope. So quite a bit of patchiness in terms of the different organisms. Um, what I'll do next is try to talk to you a little bit about species richness. Um, what you must understand is that we have very little information about the species that inhabit deep seas, um, the deep sea. We're struggling with taxonomy. So the most conf I feel the most confident to talk to you about anthozoans at this point because those are the ones that we think we have nailed the taxonomy on. The rest of the groups, you know, we're still working on, so I'm not, I'm not going to touch upon. The other problem is, is for a lot of these uh, organisms, we really just have um, images. We don't have a lot of specimens that we have collected, so really we're trying to identify, identify sponges from images. That's not, that's not a very uh, effective way of doing it. So here's species riches for athozoans at each one of those sites. So if I could walk you through that slide, again, each point is the average for an entire dive with the error for that number of quadrats across that dive. So Jordan Basin, uh, you can see 
it has the highest species richness. I should point out how low species richness is. This is one species on average per quadrat. Um, so very low species richness, and it gets lower when you go further down the, the, the slope. But it has low variability. And I'm showing you below some pictures. This is the, the area, the rock garden that I was talking about, that has this homogeneous beds of anemones. And so this is why you see this low error in, in richness um, for Jor Jordan Basin. In George's Basin, you can see richness is lower and quite variable. And you can see some pictures from the region. You can see that, that if you happen to hit a quadrat that happens to have a coral in there, then you record this as a one uh, species. But there's also a lot of regions that don't have much other than sand or pebbles. And so this is why you have this large variability in, in Georgia's basin. Northeast Channel is, is next. Uh, Northeast Channel can have higher richness. It has overall higher richness than Georgia's basin. And this is the deep water coral region. And again, I'll get to it in a bit more detail later. But, but basically, this richness corresponds to corals mostly rather than anemones. And then when we go down the continental slope, you can see that now we've lost most of the anthozoans. You get the occasional anemone. You get some sea pens, but um, very patchily distributed and uh, very low uh, abundance. So you end up with very low species richness. So in conclusion from this part of the talk, um, what we have found is we have found some hotspots of diversity in Jordan Basin, and that's that region of the Rock Garden and in Northeast Channel. We have found some hot spots of abundance, and these differ depending on the group. So brachiopods are very abundant in the deeper basins of the Gulf, whereas corals and sponges are most abundant in the Northeast Channel. We have seen an increase in abundance of the conodons with depth on the continental slope, but again, limited results. Uh, we need to keep working on our data to see if this pattern persists. It would be quite interesting if it does. But the most important thing I think that we've seen is this high spatial variability. And the spatial variability is likely linked to substrate. So we saw from the first graph that um, Northeast Channel has a lot of different kinds of substrates, and that could be a reason why it can support higher diversity. Um, on the other hand, we also have the issue of circulation. So we saw that there are circulation patterns that vary across these regions. And circulation will determine connectivity among these different, these different habitats. And so um, that's another, another aspect, another factor that could affect uh, spatial variability that we see. What I want to do next is switch a little bit to research we have been doing for the last little while. Uh, since 2001, really, on deep water corals specifically. So to start with, here's a map that was produced in 1887. It's a map that shows areas of good fishing over Nova Scotia. What I have circled in red are two regions that are marked on this map as coral. And so even back in 1887, fishers knew that these were regions that are, where coral was abundant and the region on the left-hand side is what is now the coral conservation area and where we do our work at Northeast Channel. So, um, Brian, Daniel Bryan was a student of mine who uh, took it upon herself to try to come up with a model that predicts habitat suitable for deep water coral. She used two species, Paragorgia um, um, arborea and Primnoa residuformis. And what you see on this figure are the records, the known records of deep water corals um, as of 2000 or up to 2006. And you see this at dots on this map. And you can see that these records are mainly focused uh, into two regions. Uh, the one on the, on, the, on the far left here, this is a coral, uh, this is a marine protected area now. Uh, it's called the gully. Here's Northeast Channel. This is the region that, that I'm talking about um, today. And then you see some other scatter points along, along the Gulf of Maine and on the continental slope uh, further south in the in US waters. Um, in terms of depth distributions, this is showing depths only up to 500 meters. What you see here is a percentage of the area that can be attributed 
to each one of those depths. And so the black bars show the study area. So you can see that 50% of the study area is a depth, has depths of 0 to 100 meters, and 40% has a depth, a depth of 100 to 200 meters, and so on. The open bars are the same sort of depth distributions for habitat where we find primnoa. And we can see that those are a little bit shifted to the right, so they're found in deeper depths than average for the study area. And the hatch bars are for the other coral, Paragorgia arborea, and you also can see that that's even deeper. Uh, so the areas where Paragorgia occur are significantly deeper than the average depths in the region. So they're, they're down there, they're not in shallow water. <clears throat> So what Taya did then was she tried to um, uh, uncover, and that was not particularly easy, different environmental factors for the locations of corals, known locations of corals. So she extracted information on the slope of the substrate based on bathymetry, temperature, salinity, primary production at the surface. And so based on that, she came up with a, a proposed distribution of suitable habitat for coral. The top panel shows it for Paragorgia and the bottom panel from Primnoa. The black regions, which you can see, are very thin in the top graph there, uh, show regions where you have uh, more than a 50% probability of finding corals a suitable habitat for Paragorgia, and you can see it's just in the gully and along that very thin uh, part of the continental margin whereas primnoa can occur in, in many different regions. And so this was sort of the first attempt at trying to say, well, this is where coral should be. And so what remains to be done is, is researchers have to go out there on vessels and, and ground truth the model, validate the model, see what works, see where we were right, see where we were wrong, and sort of try to improve upon it uh, to get a better model and, and do a better job, because that will assist us in locating these areas without just driving around in a ship and, and sampling blindly. Now, as I said, uh, Canada has, or Atlantic Canada, has been active in closing uh, different areas to, conserve, to coral, um, to fishing, sorry, so for coral conservation. What you see with the two black arrows are, the one on the far right is an arrow that indicates a very small region that was closed because we found Lophilia there. Uh, this is the only place where we could actually have found um, Lophilia in, the, in Atlantic Canada. The arrow next to that is the gully, which is a marine protected area in Canada. And then when we go all the way to the left, the right arrow indicates the Northeast Channel Coral Conservation Area, which is where we have been doing all our work. So here's a close-up of that area, Northeast Channel. It's about 424 kilometers square. It's not a particular big area. Uh, it was closed in 2002. Um, the decision was made. It was officially closed in 2003. The red box shows the area that's completely restricted. There's absolutely no fishing going on there whatsoever. And the blue area shows a region where long lining is permitted, but no other bottom fishing is allowed. So here's a graph that shows coral records in that region. The red, the red box is the closed region, and you can see in different colors buffers around that region. The green sort of yellow color there is, is uh, the 15-kilometer buffer, and, and the purpley is the 45-kilometer buffer. And so you can see that there's coral records not only inside the box, but there's actually quite a few corals outside the box, right? So though we're closing our region, we're certainly not protecting all the corals in the region. Um, and this is what that means. This is a figure that shows number of corals destroyed per square kilometer. And so warmer colors, red, is indicating that there's at least 10 coral damaged coral colonies of either of those two species I've been talking about uh, per, um, square kilo per kilometer. And so you can see that very close to the, like inside the box even, um, there's actually quite a high concentration of, of, of destroyed corals because of fishing. And so that sort of decreases as you move away down slope because, of course, it gets harder to fish down there. But this is one of the main reasons why this region was close to fishing, because there's a lot of damage that goes on there. So I'll just show you um, a couple of slides just to show you what you know, it looks like inside the coral conservation area. 
here is um, the two corals. Uh, Paragorgia is the more whiter one, and, and Primnoa are the pinker ones. Um, here is a, a lot of colonies of Primnoa all bunched up on, on one rock, so quite high concentration uh, at this particular location. Here is a very large uh, Paragorgia. The two dots, the laser dots, are 10 centimeters apart, and so you can see this colony is two and a half meters at least, almost across, and, and you know, two meters high, so it's a pretty old colony, um, quite large. Um, here's another close-up of a Paragorgia, and you can see that the two species are really growing in, in close proximity uh, to one another. Here you see uh, several color morphs of Paragorgia, white, purple, and pink. Uh, at some point it was thought that this may be different species of subspecies, but, but they're actually not. They're all the same species, and we have no idea why they're exhibiting these different color morphs. Um, here's another close-up. These are much smaller corals. Uh, but you can see they're very sort of patchy on those boulders um, uh, where they occur. And when you look at this sort of flyover, you can see that certainly not the entire area is not really covered with coral. There's quite a few colonies, but, but it's not by any means 100% um, covered. So um, the way they started, the coral conservation area sort of was launched, um, was the Department of Fish, the fishermen actually approached the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which is the, the government agency that manages resources, and suggested that there's something going on, there's a lot of weird things, coral, deep water corals down there, and, and they should figure out what's going on that perhaps close it. So it was actually the fishers themselves, the longliners, that came to brought this to the attention. So in 2001, we had a cruise um, in the coral conservation area, and some of those results are published here in this paper by Paul Mort Mortensen and, and, and Lena Buell Mortensen. Um, here what you see are in circles, the stars of the circle indicate abundance of Primnoa on the left and Paragorgia on the right, in, but a horizontal pattern in abundance across different regions in the Northeast Channel. And so you can see larger circles in some areas, but not everywhere, suggesting that there is a horizontal variability in, 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 in abundance of these corals. Now, these were all results that were done, um, sampled at less than 500 meters depth. And so it was really after this study that DFO had the quantitative data to go out and say, okay, we're closing this region, we know there are coral, they're quite abundant, and we need to protect them. From the same study, um, we also looked at abundance with depth, and each one of those panels, you see two panels on, on the right hand, on the left hand side are, correspond to Primnoa, each panel to a different location in, in Northeast Channel, and the two on the right are Paragorgia. And so you can see that for Primnoa, abundance tends to increase um, at about 400 to 500 meters depth. The same is true for Paragorgia for one site. In the other site, there seems to be high abundance even at 300 meters, but not much goes on above 300 meters depth. Most of these things are, are deeper down. Now, in 2006, when we went out, we actually, because we had ropes, we could go to deeper waters than 500 meters. And so here you sort of see the continuation from the previous graph now going to greater depths. Um, Primnoa on the left, Paragorgia on the right. So you can see that the abundance of Primnoa continues to decrease from 500. When you go deeper, it goes down to almost non-existent at, at the bottom of the channel. So it seems like they peak at around 400, 500 meters, and then they decrease. In contrast, Paragorgia seems to be pretty flat. Um, these colony densities are the same as they were in the previous slide at 500 meters. So it seems like it's sort of almost non-existent up to 500 meters, but then it maintains a constant, if not quite variable, uh, abundance all the way down to the bottom of, of the channel. We also looked at size of colonies, and so some interesting patterns came up here. Um, these panels, the top two panels are for Primnoa, the bottom two panels are for Paragorgia. The panels on the left are average size, and the panels on the right are maximum size. So if we look at the top two figures, we can see that for Primnoa, both average and maximum size decreases with depth. However, when we look at Paragorgia, we see the opposite. Uh, we see that colony height actually increases with depth. And 
maximum height, we saw the largest colonies down in 900 meters depth, and those were the ones that were two and a half meters high. So, quite large. So, to sort of finish this part of the talk then, uh, this was focused for corals within the Northeast, uh, Northeast Channel Coral Conservation Area. And what we saw was the coral abundance, colony abundance, sorry, varies with depth. Primnoa seems to be most abundant at 400 to 600 meters, whereas Paragorgia seems to be virtually absent and shallower than 300 meters, but pretty constant in abundance um, between 400 and 900 meters. Colony size decreases for Primnoa, but increases for Paragorgia. And so there's different factors that could, um, could be invoked to explain these patterns. Uh, Fishing could result in, in increasing in colony size for Paragorgia. So Paragorgia is a species that is particularly inflexible. Primnoa tends to be a little bit more flexible. And so it could be that essentially it has a, uh, si a refuge from fishing at those greater depths. And so it can grow bigger. It, it, so those colonies are actually older because they have managed to survive fishing. Um, now, for, in terms of abundance, uh, the, bun the issue of abundance could be a matter of recruitment. And um, it could be that uh, recruitment decreases with depth, and this is why abundance of corals in general decreases with depth. And so we decided, uh, as part of our studies, to try to address, to some extent, this issue, this issue of, of recruitment, try to see if we can measure recruitment which has never been measured before for these corals. <clears throat> so um, what we did is we set up a study to look at recruitment and population connectivity. So we looked at coral habitats, but we're trying to not limit it to uh, coral because, because we, mean, we didn't know if we would get coral. And so we're looking at all the macro and megafauna that would recruit in coral habitats. And so in order to do this, we deployed this arrays of settlement substrates uh, what you see on the top left is an array at the beginning and deployed um, or at the beginning of the deployment. When you see at the bottom left is an array at the end of the deployment. Top right is a close-up of an array at the end of the deployment. And you can see we have brittle stars and anemones and all sorts of things settled on these arrays. But most importantly, what you see on the bottom right is a baby coral. So we did actually get uh, corals to recruit within Northeast Channel, which was very exciting for us because we didn't know if we would get any coral, but at least we now can estimate recruitment um, based on those deployments that we did. So this is a close-up of a larval collector. Uh, these collectors were deployed uh, in 2006. They were recovered in 2010. We were going to recover them in 2009, but the cruise was canceled, so those are, those are the, the, the factors you have to take into consideration. Uh, we deployed them at three locations within the Northeast Channel Coral Conservation Area that varied in depth, which you see there uh, from 655 to 863 meters, but they also varied in position within canyons, so they were in the upstream versus the downstream locations of canyons. We used two types of substrate, a simple and a complex one. The simple one were basalt blocks that, had, uh, that you see there on the, on the picture on the right-hand side, the basalt blocks are on the left-hand side of that picture. Um, and uh, the area was the planar area was 75 centimeters squared. And we had complex substrates, which are essentially kitchen scrubbies, sponge pads, that have the same projected area, planar area, as the simple ones, but they actually have a much larger volume because they have interstitial spaces. And so in each of those collectors we deployed, we had 10 uh, basalt blocks and, and six sponge pads. So the arrays were put down. Here's that box that I show you at the ROV in the beginning. You sit there on the, on the left-hand side. This is a box that's now sitting at the front of the ROV, and if you peek through it, you can see a red frame. That's the array sitting there. It has been recovered. And you can see that at the top of the box, we have this open cell foam. So what happens is we put the box down, and then, and then we, right next to the array, we gently pick up the array, we put it in the box, and then when we tighten it, that foam sort of compresses right over the settlement plates and, and sort of keeps them snug in the box so they don't move during ascent. 
but at the same time doesn't damage anything because it's soft. And so on the right-hand side, you can see the actual array sitting there in the box, uh, ready to be taken apart. So these are very, very preliminary results uh, from those uh, arrays. Um, so first of all, here is um, a, a number, the number of species that we got in each type of, of substrate. I have a picture there of the substrates to remind you again. Uh, the simple one had anywhere from two to eight species per, 75, per, per substrate, and the complex one had about 12 to 13 species for the same um, planar area. So overall, simple substrates are 20 species and complex substrates 21. The panel on the right-hand side shows species per settlement unit for simple and complex. And so you can see that in general, there's higher species richness in the complex substrates than in the simple ones. There's quite a bit of range in number of species for the simple ones, um, but the red dot there indicates the median. So the median was about five species per settlement unit. Now, if we look at the community composition, let's look at the simple substrates first. So here's a little pictures of coral recruits. And this was the only species that was actually found on all the units. We always found coral recruits. In some units, they made uh, up to 88% of the abundance of recruits. And what you see there in the figure is a size frequency distribution of those recruits. So this is all of them pooled, uh, 96 individuals. The sizes, they were quite small. They were 2.3 to 8.4 millimeters. So these are just little guys that have just recruited. And so what you see in red is, is recruits that are primary polyp only. In blue, you see primary plus one budding polyp. So you can see that around three millimeters is when they pop the first budding polyp. And so then in green, you see the primary plus two budding polyps. And you can see that that happens at around six millimeters. So three millimeter recruits, is when they pop the first budding polyp, six millimeters pop the second one. So very, very young guys. This was very exciting. In terms of other species or overall species composition, the first thing that I really would like to point out here, for those of you that don't study the deep sea or for those of you that study recruitment in shallow water, um, extremely low abundance. These substrates were down for four years, okay? Eight to 36 recruits. Four years, 75 centimeters square. And so the majority for simple substrata, you can see, is cnidarian, so anemones and corals. And, but there were also some arthropods, annelids, and mollusks. If we look at the complex substrata, again, extremely low number of recruits, 38 and 45 recruits, respectively, for each one of the two substrates that have been processed. Here we have different... Um, Abundances, the arthropods and the annelids are the most dominant um, groups, with mollusks, echinoderms, nematodes, and nidaria also being present. So different dominant groups, different substrate. A lot of these guys, the annelids, were in the spaces of the sponge, um, and, and so that's why they recruited there. So if we calculate the shannon Wiener index for this, this pretty much follows the, the species richness patterns. And we can see that overall diversity is greater in the complex substrata than it is on the simple ones. So what I want to show you next is a few pictures from um, uh, recruitment that has happened in situ. This is, we think, a telephone cable that was laid between Europe and, and the United States. Um, we don't know when it was laid, but we could probably find out when it was laid. But what you see on that cable is a whole bunch of uh, organisms that have recruited, including baby corals. So you can see Primnoa, you can see um, here, you can see a baby Paragorgia, little Primnoa, uh, but you can also see anemones, sponges, uh, etc., of, of different sizes. And here's a close up again, you can see what I want to point out these are all, all Paragorgia. And what I want to point out is the range in, in size that you can get for these colonies. And again, here's the range in size. You can see that Paragorgia is actually quite significant. And so what this suggests is at least for some reason this cable, and I can think of some reasons, this cable is, is you know, good substrate. And there has been, although not a lot, the cable is not covered, there hasn't been a lot of recruitment. There's been consistent recruitment, which is why we get all these different sizes. 
So this is good news. This is a closed area to con for conservation reasons. It's good to see that, that it's actually working because corals do recruit in this region. We didn't know if they would, uh, simply that they were already there. So to finish up from this part of the study, what we did find was, was that the structural complexity of the microhabitat affects both the composition and the diversity of the recruits. However, um, the most important finding, I think, is, is the slowness of, of recruitment. And so I did a calculation there where we get one colony, of, this is just for corals, one colony per 10 meters square per year to recruit. This is based on, on the values that we obtained. Um, and that's probably an overestimate because we ended up having you know, several colonies, 10, 20 colonies in one little space. And when you go out, as you see in the picture beside there, you don't get 10 colonies uh, for that small space, which is, suggests that after recruitment, a lot of those colonies die, either because they get eaten or because they get bulldozed or because they settled on a rock or a pebble that then that rolled away and killed them. But I think the number of, that we have is actually an overestimate. So recruitment is even slower than this. And this is important when you're trying to close an area, um, you know, for conservation, if it's damaged, uh, you know, it's going to take a long time for it to come back. Um, another study that I haven't mentioned, but that we're doing in collaboration with Dr. Ellen Kensington at DFO, is to look at the genetic relatedness of the recruits that we have with the surrounding colonies. So Ellen collected samples from all the colonies that were around the settlement collectors, and, and, and then she will opt for genetic analysis, and she will also do it on the recruits. The idea here, trying to understand whether the recruits are just coming from locally or whether they're coming from further away, and of course that is also very important uh, when you're trying to manage these conservation areas. So let's talk a little bit, that's the last thing I want to talk about. I want to talk about the implications of our research and our findings for management and conservation. So here's that map of the Gulf of Maine, and there is that line that goes right across it that separates the U.S. from Canada. And so the problem is, it's, it's not really, the, 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 the problem that we have been facing is that it's very difficult for a Canadian vessel to obtain permission to do research in U.S. and vice versa. And so what happens is we have generally been restricted in those areas that you see there outlined in red, Jordan Basin and George's Basin, those are the two deep basins in, in the Gulf of Maine that are in the Canadian waters, and of course at the Northeast Challenge Conservation Area. There is another basin, uh, Wilkinson Basin, which you see there in yellow arrows, but that's in U.S. waters. And the U.S. Uh, colleagues haven't really found a reason or having, you know, the motivation to, vi to, to visit Wilkinson Basin, so there's no data from there. But you can see that if you're trying to manage this Gulf of Maine, or even regions of the Gulf of Maine, you can't isolate one region from the other. I showed you how, in terms of circulation, the water comes in from around Nova Scotia, goes around, it probably hits Jordan Basin first, then it goes to Wilkinson Basin, then it goes to George's Basin, and then it exits through Northeast Channel. So presumably, all these sites are linked. And we don't know how they're linked biologically. And so uh, the other interesting link is with those stars you see there just south of George's Bank. These are all canyons uh, in the US. Um, and the water runs along the canyons there north towards Northeast Channel and off um, you know, uh, to, uh, towards Europe. And so again, all those canyons are presumably linked with one another, at least the water masses are, and then the same water hits Northeast Channel. Again, if you're trying to manage a region, you can't just use one area in isolation. So we do need to do better. And I think we are doing better. So most recently I was uh, at a meeting where we're trying to coordinate with research from the U.S. to do collaborate for the canyon work. They're working in canyons. And um, uh, what this will allow us to do is sort of look at this, this conservation, not only of coral, but of other uh, habitats, on a seascape level. And so what I've shown here is, is the effort. So I was saying that we are sampling on scales of meters through Gulf of Maine. Well, we are, but, but I think most of us are looking at the tens of meter scales, which are areas within basins within national jurisdictions. And so if we want to go from that truly 
truly cross to the other side, the Gulf of Maine and continental margin, we do have to work on this US-Canada collaboration. And so if we do that, we will be able to look at the nature, extent, and patchiness of these deep sea communities in the region. And I think we have, we have um, uh, a good start. Um, what you see in the box there, in the red box, is Jordan Basin. I've been talking about Jordan Basin, uh, and so I will show you some more pictures of it when that's how we land. But uh, I was recently at a workshop in the United States that NOAA organized. And as a follow-on from that workshop, um, colleagues from uh, fisheries uh, management in Maine contacted us because they're trying to launch an attempt to close Jordan Basin, you know, south of the yellow line. And so we're trying to collaborate because we also have this with Rock Garden region, which I will show you here. Here's a few pictures of that rock garden. You can see it's a beautiful site. It's really quite unique. It's not particularly spatially extensive. You can see it has corals, but it also has a fantastic, you know, coverage, a palette of colors of anemones and sponges. Here it is again, um, that almost complete cover by anemones and some sponges, and here it is again. So this is a small area. We thought we should be able to do something about closing this area to fishing. Now, because the American colleagues are also have for different reasons uh, decided to close Jordan Basin, this may actually become an opportunity where both governments can get together and cross the boundaries and actually save a region, conserve a region uh, that, that crosses boundaries and national ju jurisdictions, which would be great. So. I will stop here. What I would like to do, here's one more picture of the rock garden. Um, what I would like to do is sort of bring again your attention to the fact that this is not my effort. Um, there's a lot of collaborators very closely work with Dr. Peter Lawton from Fisheries and Oceans, Paul Snellgrove from Memorial, and Sam Bentley from Memorial, who's a geologist. Ellen Kensington, as I said, we're doing genetics work together. Uh, she's at Fisheries and Oceans. A number of students. And of course, all the different uh, funding agencies, NSERC, the Canadian Healthy Oceans Network, and of course, Fishers and Oceans, and the crews of the ship and the ROVs that have helped along the way. So I'll stop there and I'll take any questions if there are any.